the next item on the agenda is a statement by the Vice President of the Commission, High Representative of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, on the situation in Syria. And on behalf of the Commission, I give the floor to Commissioner Fuller. Madam President, uh, thank you very much and allow me uh, on behalf of the Vice President of the Commission and High Representative uh, to make the following uh, statement. Um, Honourable Members, <clears throat> the situation in and uh, around Syria remains extremely difficult. Since last year, most humanitarian statistics, such as the number of those affected in numerous ways by the fighting, have doubled. With 9.3 million Syrians in need of outside assistance, half of them children, we have reached the limits of what the international community can do. The neighboring countries are sheltering close to 3 million refugees. The European Union continues to support them, but the dangers for Lebanon and Jordan, as well as threats to the territorial integrity of Iraq, are real. At the United Nations Humanitarian Conference hosted by Kuwait, the European Union pledged an additional $550 million for the relief effort in Syria, raising its overall effort to €2.6 billion. Euros. Yet the United Nations' unprecedented fundraising appeal of €6.5 of euros clearly shows the urgency of settling the conflict as the capacity of international donors is reaching limits. The international community worked hard in Kuwait, but only slightly more than a third of that sum was raised. That is why the recent launch of the Geneva Conference in Syria on 26 January in Montreux is so important. As stressed by High Representative and Vice President uh, in Montreux, the Geneva Conference on Syria is unique as it has a clear political legitimacy found in the United Nations Security Council Resolution 2118 to work together to fully implement the Geneva Communique as of 30th June 2012. In the first round of negotiations, progress has been slow, but the parties are now talking to each other and we need to remind ourselves that reaching the goals stated in the Geneva Communique will be an arduous process. The European Union considers that it is important to maintain a double-track approach by discussing the difficult issue of a political transition and at the same time promoting confidence-building measures that could alleviate some of the suffering being experienced by the Syrian people. Even small progress that would, for example, enable more humanitarian access to those trapped in the conflict zone would be a success that would help sustain the negotiations. The tactics of starve and surrender practiced by the regime must end. Yet our responsibility goes beyond our humanitarian obligations and supporting the Geneva process. That is why it should be our ambition to reach out to groups that have not taken up arms and that can play a role in settling the conflict. Here, the role of women is crucial. And the High Representative Ashton, in her meetings with the Syrian women in Switzerland, promised a dedicated European Union effort to support their role in the envisioned transition. The European Union also has the ambition to look beyond the conflict and assist in educating and training of young Syrians who will be the key to Syria's future. To this effect, the European Union is planning to develop an ambitious training program in cooperation with our Member States. Honourable Members, Syria's crisis has profoundly affected its neighbours. 
they must be applauded for their efforts to host an increasing number of Syrian refugees. It is important to reiterate that the European Union's support to Syria now focuses mainly on Syrians that fled to neighboring countries. To that, our support is also addressed to the host countries and communities. We will also maintain all other forms of assistance, including those targeting areas under the control of the opposition to maintain and develop most vital services. With these and many other efforts, the European Union will help Syrians to reach their goal of living in dignity, freedom and democracy. I would like to reemphasize that the European Union will continue in its humanitarian efforts and spare no effort to deliver life-saving and medical aid to besieged areas. The European Union also has the ambition to look beyond the conflict and assist in educating and training young Syrians who will be key to the Syria's future. There is little doubt that the Geneva process will be a long and complex one, but we must work relentlessly with all partners in the international community to reach the desired goal of a peaceful and reunited Syria. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Now the speakers on behalf of the political groups for the EPP, Mr. Brock, who has two minutes. Madam President, Commissioner, colleagues, the Syrian conflict has to do with internal difficulties, but it's also a proxy war being waged by others. Iran is involved, Russia is involved, Saudi Arabia is involved, and they should all be made to do their bit for peace. The violence waged by Assad on the civilian population a part of that 9.3 million citizens are directly affected by the war 6 million are on the move Lebanon a small country of 4 million people has a million refugees from Syria those are heart-rending figures I hope the international community will now do its bit to sort the situation out to get rid of the chemical weapons and I hope that Ibrahimi's efforts to get government and opposition round the table will be taken seriously I hope that people will take responsibility for their own nation rather than just use this as a fig leaf to hide more violence, more killing. Commissioner, the disaster assistance is helping but is not enough. There are other countries that are struggling to cope. Jordan, Turkey, for example, and I hope that the international community can do more and that a humanitarian corridor will be the first outcome of Geneva and that it will be possible to get uh, humanitarian aid through uh, with a view to easing the people's pain and paving the way to peace. Now for the S&D group, Madame de Keser, please. Thank you, Madam President. The war in Syria will can rumble on. All the analysts are talking about an unprecedented humanitarian disaster and a complete upheaval of the landscape in the Middle East. The, uh, prox the proxy wars um, being waged by external forces seek to change long term the 
confessional and political uh, power situation and the risk of a broader conflagration is enormous. Geneva too um, has shown a sense of responsibility on the part of the international community. The, the, the um, EU, the US and Russia have got through to the uh, belligerents but we must do more. Um, Iran was not admitted to the table and with Lagdar Brahimi we must now change the half success in Ge Ge Geneva to a, a lasting uh, negotiation which can restore confidence. More than three million children in Syria have, have not attended school for the past three years. This week an unbearable report from the UN talked about the Syrian armed forces and the belligerents, talked of torture of children, sexual abuse and some of the executions. In Erbuk, the, the, um, there is desperation. The picture of 5,000 Syrians who had been tortured and had their slits, uh, their throats slit, um, people kidnapped, abducted, both by the regime and by terrorist groups who have, alas, infiltrated the opposition. To attenuate this terrible suffering, money is needed. But beyond that, uh, up, um, political resolve and uh, determination, because we must take away the oxygen which terrorism needs. The EU is not everything, but it's something on the world stage, as you saw in the negotiations, the nuclear negotiations with Iran. I think that Syria, uh, in Syria, the EU can make the difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next for the ALDE group, Mr. Verhofstadt, two and a half minutes. So, uh, for me, the uh, Geneva II conference, uh, Mr. Commissioner, has proved one thing. That is that uh, with Bashar al-Assad, there will be no solution ever. Uh, for Syria. He refused uh, to talk about a political way out of the crisis. He refused even to make a deal on Homs and Yarmouk, places where thousands of people are currently starving of death. He refused also to end the blockade so that food can, uh, can go inside uh, these uh, cities. And in the meantime, the Assad regime throws barrel bombs on, on cities. Finally, we have seen, uh, you have seen, as I have seen, uh, the 55,000 horrible pictures of dead and mutilated bodies and the report of the three former prosecutors about uh, 11,000 members of the opposition killed and eliminated systemically in the prisons of Assad. What word can you use for that? The only word that I can find is that there are crimes against humanity and that the time is there now that we put Bashar al-Assad for an international criminal court or at least to put out the charges against him. And I ask myself what we need more uh, to start this process. Secondly, we need naturally to do everything what is in our uh, possibilities and in our power to limit the suffering of the Syrian people. And I think we should issue EU humanitarian visas not only by Germany, France and Austria, who did it already, but EU-wide in every country of the Union. We have also the Temporary Protection Directive since 2001. Why we don't use it? Why also not establish a regional protection uh, program? Why not encourage visa facilitation? Let us take up our responsibility towards the Syrian refugees. In total, there are 2.4 million, as you know. 400,000 have been regist registered only in January. And what is Europe doing? 33,000. That is not even 1% of, totally, of the total amount of refugees. And I find this shameful. I find it a, a disgrace. And finally, uh, uh, Mr. Fuller, we have asked already with the Parliament, uh, I think two times or three times in a resolution for a Europe, uh, European humanitarian conference on the Syrian refugee crisis. Uh, the Commission has backed that. It was Mr. Barnier in a, in a debate who backed that idea. At what moment the Commission shall put that proposal before the uh, Council? Council of Ministers of Foreign Affairs, or the European Council, though that finally Europe can take its responsibility in this uh, humanitarian crisis. Thank you very much. Now for the Greens, Madame Durand, who has two minutes. Oui, merci. Thank you, President. Well, we've had many resolutions on Syria, and uh, its length is 
disproportionate with our lack of uh, ability to do anything. Now, in the uh, trade sector, people say during the works it's business as usual, and unfortunately, before Geneva II, there were no preconditions. Despite that, and despite the fact people decided we should just get going, what ever the situation, I think it's difficult to understand why it is that uh, barrel bombs are being thrown on Aleppo um, while Geneva II is uh, going on. And so I think you have to uh, think about how we negotiate a ceasefire, perhaps without the Syrians, with the Americans and the Russians, uh, uh, so that we can actually make some headway. Now, we should remember that it's not just about humanitarian aid. There are a huge number of refugees, not just in Syria, but also in Jordan, in Lebanon, and other countries. And uh, we're only uh, accepting 50,000 refugees. And when you talk to the Jordan Jordanian or Leban Lebanese authorities, you're seeing that, in fact, three quarters of school children in certain schools are actually Syrian. Uh, Syrian refugees. Thirdly, talking about money, let's uh, remember uh, the question of uh, payment appropriations. They're not on the agenda today. Uh, people on the ground are not able to continue any of the projects. It's very, very serious. We can draw up a list of uh, uh, figures for what we would like to do, but let's get the uh, payment appropriations going on the ground, first and foremost. No. We need to remember also that countries such as Jordan and Lebanon are very fragile countries, politically speaking, now. They're not just in a humanitarian difficult situation, they're in a politically explosive one. And we don't want their situation to get any worse. Uh, after all, this is a proxy conflict. Furthermore, sooner or later, we need to evaluate the errors that we made at the start of this uh, conflict. And one of the at, uh, right at the very beginning of the uprising, we should have perhaps behaved rather differently, and then we perhaps wouldn't be in the current situation that we're in. Furthermore, in EU countries, we need to honour our own responsibilities and as Europeans, as member states, not just uh, uh, financing operations on the ground or in neighbouring countries. Thank you, ECR, Mr Stevenson. One and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Commissioner Fula said the Syrian crisis has profoundly affected its neighbours. Well, last November, I visited Kurdistan in northern Iraq to see for myself the refugee camps that they've set up to provide shelter for over 230,000 men, women and children fleeing from the bloody civil war in Syria. I believe we owe a great debt of gratitude to President Massoud Barzani of Kurdistan and to the Kurdish people. Despite the suffering of the Kurds under Saddam Hussein, when over 180,000 were massacred in the genocidal Al-Anfal campaign, nevertheless they have maintained a tradition of welcoming and sheltering refugees whom they regard as their brothers and sisters in need. Hundreds of thousands of Christians, Turkmen, Shabaks and other ethnic refugees fled to Kurdistan during the insurgency in the rest of Iraq and sadly that situation is now worsening and civil war I think is imminent in Iraq and it's against that background that the Kurds have opened their borders to give shelter to the refugees from Syria and we must provide the KRG with all possible assistance to enable them to deal with this new and overwhelming tide of starving and exhausted people. One of the first things we must do, Commissioner, is open an EEAS consular office in Erbil President Barzani called for this when he spoke in the AFEC committee two weeks ago in Brussels. It would be a highly significant gesture of support for Kurdistan if Baroness Ashton followed the example of many EU member states who have themselves opened consular offices in our bill. Thank you. Thank you for the GUE group. Mr. Hatsihir here, one minute. President, the Syrian people is uh, in the middle of a tragedy which must be brought to an end. We see scenes of um, tragedy every day. 
and nothing has been done to meet the um, Syrian people's expectations and demand, aspirations to uh, peace and democracy. Geneva too was supposed to bring the solution in order to restore an independent Syria. The uh, belligerents must put their arms down and we must stop, we must, uh, the EU must stop selling arms to the belligerents. We must have a conference bringing together all the, the, the segments of the population and the different parts of the population. First steps, we must have um, a ceasefire so that humanitarian aid can get through to, in particular, to areas under siege. Uh, with refugees in uh, Yarmouk, we don't want to see, to people, to see people uh, d dying needlessly. Thank you very much. Thank you, and for the EFT, Mr. Belder has one minute. Thank you, Madam President. If we're going to talk about the role of Turkey in the Syrian conflict, well then, the European institutions haven't said much at all. They're strangely silent, but the Turkish media is not silent, and uh, therefore there are a couple of things I want to ask Commissioner Fula. Firstly, should we not ask the Turkish authorities to uh, um, talk more about the um, two uh, Syrians who were kidnapped? Abu Bennett was one of them, uh, kidnapped in April uh, and is in uh, a prison in Istanbul uh, being kept securely by the Turkish security forces. And secondly, we need to ask the Turkish authorities to say something about the uh, three training camps uh, on Turkish territory f which are training Al-Qaeda forces as uh, the Israeli general uh, recently demonstrated by way of satellite photos. So those are two requests and I would like a written request from you Commissioner Fula to those uh, because uh, I can send you the reports from the Turkish media about these two requests as well. Thank you for the non-attached. Mr. Griffin has one minute. Madam Chairman, unlike the others in this debate, I've gone twice to war torn Syria to see firsthand what's really going on there. So I can tell you that the majority of the refugees do not want or need to come to Europe. They just want the West to leave the Syrian army to finish off the Islamist terror gangs from whom the Christians, Alawites and moderate Sunnis fled for their lives. Then they can go home. The Wahhabi minority should go to their Gulf state sponsors where they would also be at home. And I can also tell you that, having used the CIA to help the rebels destroy so much of Syria, American and French corporations are already in contact with Damascus to negotiate multi-billion dollar reconstruction contracts. While the EU and Mr Farage unite to import a wave of violently Islamist asylum seekers to already poor and stressed parts of our constituency, American and French companies are chasing big business profits as usual. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Lisek has one and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Madam President, Commissioner, colleagues. Of course, what is happening in Syria is terrible. Terrible for the country, for its people, for its families, for its women and children who are being killed day in, day out. It is a terrible tra tragedy for millions of people who have had to leave Syria. Is there a glimmer of hope, I think the only option is reconciliation between the pro-Assad forces and the Free Syrian Army, and indeed between the Free Syrian Army and the radical Islamists, or indeed common or garden criminals. There are many protagonists rendering the situation very complicated. We're also aware of the chemical weapons located in Syria. 
Only pressure brought to bear by the international community, led by the European Union, the United States of America, Russia, and Syria's neighbors like Turkey and possibly Iran, only that pressure can deliver results. Grazie, onorevole Gomes. Un minuto e trenta. Mrs. Gomes, one and a half minutes. Madam President, the Geneva process will take a long time. And of course, the um, troops, their representatives will be together with international um, bodies. And that's perhaps what it will take to put an end to the suffering in a country where there are millions of people on the move and refugees. It was a major mistake to not involve Iran in negotiations. They are important. They loom large in the region and as part of a solution. The nuclear uh, program in Iran is one thing. Um, again, that's uh, important regionally and they should have been uh, invited to the table to solve the crisis in Syria. The other countries in the region must be made to face their responsibilities, for example, Saudi Arabia, so that the opposition cannot fall into the hands of the extremists. Decisions have to be taken. Measures must be undertaken to restore, uh, to enhance uh, confidence with a ceasefire, with the release of prisoners, with the creation of humanitarian corridors. But this will only be possible uh, with a political um, transition on the basis of Geneva II. This war has been going on for three years. The United Nations tells us the toll of dead and injured, um, bearing down in particular on children, children who are being used as couriers and as messengers and this systematic uh, violation of children's rights in Syria is all the more reason why Bashar al-Assad and other torturers in Syria should be um, indicted and taken to the International Court of Justice. Look at the situation of the refugees in Yarmouk. Uh, then again, the international community must intervene. Hence, it is so important for the EU and Russia and the other countries for them to act in the context of the UN so that we can find a way out of this terrible humanitarian crisis. Mrs. Nate Sautenbrook, two minutes. Dear colleagues, Mr. Commissioner, while uh, the events in Syria confront us with uh, uh, seldom, if not never seen, levels of destruction and human cruelty and, and, and horror, I believe that we, we, we must concentrate on trying to uh, help finding a, a solution. It must be clear by now, after three years of uh, mainly military conflict, that there will be no military solution to the situation, that only a political solution is, is possible. A political solution uh, entails, of course, the participation of all the main partners and all the main actors in uh, the, this tragedy. Uh, the start of the Geneva talks a few weeks ago uh, offered a, a very faint glimmer of, of hope. It was to be expected from the start that uh, this can only be the start of a very long, painful, difficult process and we should not lose patience in the course of it and we should do everything we can in order to exercise, exert maximum influence on whoever can bring about or help to bring about a, a, a solution, an end to uh, the bloodshed. That means talking to the, the regimes uh, in, in, in the region, that means convincing the opposition forces to uh, build unity, to uh, open up to representatives of uh, civil society, to uh, involve the half, the half of mankind, that is women, uh, to uh, see to it that the rights of uh, children uh, are not neglected, uh, 
and so on and so on. It will take efforts, endeavors by everybody concerned to bring about a peaceful solution. We should not lose hope and we should work together in order to try to bring about a solution. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Salavrakos has one minute. Thank you, Madam President. There is no doubt that the situation in Syria continues to be tragic, with um, tens of thousands of people killed and uh, millions of people forced from their homes. And the problem is that the surrounding countries and terrorist organizations are playing political games. And it's clear that there is fratricidal um, internecine strife between the different forces in the, um, in the opposition. And we are seeing not just uh, warring factions, but warring factions within individual uh, factions, which does not uh, bode well for the future. The um, talks um, with the opposition, so far the prospects have been very uh, dim. Um, and it's necessary for there to be some degree of international mutual recognition. Secondly, cer certainly we must see an end to the chemical arsenal in uh, Syria. And um, Malta, uh, Syria and Crete, the Mediterranean, of course, is a closed basin. It's got a very low rate of water renewal. And we must not see... Uh, uh, um, pollution on a massive scale because that will be around for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Stasny is next for one and a half minutes. Thank you, Madam President. I support the text of the resolution that strongly condemns the violence and barbarities currently occurring in Syria. Yet, we must be clear that al-Assad has no future in the Syrian government after a transitional body is formed. Under his regime, tens of thousands of innocent Syrian civilians have been systematically tortured, killed and massacred. The EU and other participating bodies in the Geneva talks must make sure that these negotiations are constructive and follow the Geneva communique passed in 2012. We must not waste time and begin the transition of power from al-Assad regime to the people of Syria. Enough blood has been shed over the last two years. It is time for democracy and peace to prevail in Syria. It is not achievable if al-Assad stays in power. Thank you very much, Madam President. Thank you very much. Mr. Pascu, one minute. Uh, it should be noted, however, that the parties uh, to the Syrian conflict have been brought at the negotiating table through international pressure rather than through their own conviction. For them, the military confrontation remains their main interaction. The link between the military situation and the negotiations is crucial. After all, the negotiations have been forced on the parties because the level of violence has become horrifying and there is no military solution to the conflict. Indeed, at least for some time, the military situation will remain paramount. The parties would try to position themselves on the battlefields as best as they could to acquire an advantage at the negotiating table. Consequently, the military situation could derail the talks. Therefore, the aim would be to keep the negotiations on until the balance between military action and talks would reverse in favor of the latter and talks would acquire a motivation of their own. Only then we could say that the prevailing logic is that of negotiating rather than fighting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mrs. Kratzer, one minute. Thank you, Madam President. Commissioner, 
you talked about the efforts by the European Union and the international community to address the humanitarian crisis in Syria. Now this is a, m a major challenge and more funds will be required both from the EU and from the international community in order to bring um, s comfort to the Syrians surrounding countries as well and the, all the humanitarian organizations which um, in the teeth of major difficulties are continuing their work. Now the Geneva talks will take a long time if they do not collapse. Now we know that um, this is going to continue. We know that um, thousands of people are dying as the days roll by and we know that uh, explosives are being used in bombardment. Has the Commissioner given thought to, are there circumstances which might lead to a political solution? Can we imagine that Assad will uh, leave or that other things will happen? Uh, could the Geneva talks collapse and then be replaced by something else which is uh, more credible? What information do you have? with regard to chemical weapons um, which are supposed to be uh, destroyed. Clearly security in the Mediterranean, in this part of the Mediterranean is um, of the essence. Can you mark our card on that area too? Thank you. Please, you're the floor. Mrs. Coppa, Mr. President, just a few days after the suspension of talks in Geneva, we are here once again talking about the situation in Syria. The only positive thing in Geneva too is that um, it is w one step along the way, uh, perhaps towards um, a solution with a transitional government. In the meantime, the war rumbles on with its uh, litany of dead and injured. As we've said so often, the crisis in Syria is not a regional conflict. On the contrary, it's a th uh, threat. It could um, start a wider conflagration across the Middle East. We, the international community, must exert strong pressure so that we can see, our, um, so that humanitarian bodies are able to deliver relief, particularly when it comes to women and children. There must be support for the refugees at Europe, EU level as well. Um, a plan for um, allocation of uh, refugees coming into Europe, so that the ones who are the the the, uh, the on the immediate frontiers are not the only ones to uh, have to uh, cope with the, the influx. Everything must be done to, uh, to uh, make sure that the chemical weapons are not simply dumped at sea in international waters of, of Crete uh, because that would be a, a major disaster. Thank you, President. I, of course, want to associate myself with my, the remarks made by my colleagues about the atrocities being carried out in Syria. But I want to use my minute to draw particular attention to the situation of Palestinians in Syria. As with so many conflicts, the Palestinian people are being disproportionately affected. Almost all of the 540,000 Palestinian refugees in Syria are in need of emergency assistance and are entirely reliant on the UN Relief and Works Assistance. In particular, the situation for the 18,000 Palestinians in the Yarmouk refugee camp is desperate and shocking. The camp has been under siege since July, with limited medical and food supplies being allowed to enter. The conditions are reported to be atrocious, and more than 50 people have now died of starvation. UNRWA was allowed limited access on the 30th of January to distribute food and medication, but its work was halted when gunfire began nearby. Only 1,000 of the 18,000 refugees received food parcels, and only enough to last them 10 days. The situation in Yarmouk is absolutely untenable and in danger of becoming a massive humanitarian crisis. I, of course, deplore the actions of the Assad regime and welcome the fact that the European Commission and the High Representative are continuing to try and find a safe humanitarian corridor so that UNRWA can continue its refugee work in that area. Thank you, President. Thank you. Mr. Zala, you have the floor. Colleagues, two facts are crystal clear. First, there will be no military solution. Neither side can win. Diplomacy, aiming for a political transition of power, is the only way of ending this tragedy. Second, the role of Iran is crucial. 
Tehran can effectively block any solution, but Iran is also the only player capable of forcing Assad to step back. The rhetoric of new President Rouhani offers some hope, but Iran must yet demonstrate that its new foreign policy course is serious and credible, not only in the nuclear negotiation, but also in Syria. Helping to achieve a political solution could be the basis of Iran's reinvented regional role. The EU should develop a broad-based dialogue with Iran, including on Syria. Given our limited options for action in Syria, we must take advantage of any strategic opening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, now we come to catch the eye, and the first person is Mrs. Korkola. Although there was not much by way of uh, expectations of the Geneva II talks, the result was still uh, disappointing with the number of deaths continuing, another 1,700. Both sides are guilty of crimes against humanity. The pictures are from Syria are showing a violence on an industrial scale. People living in camps among corpses, eating cats and dogs. It is uh, uh, deeply uh, regrettable. The negotiations are to start again in the course of February, but uh, yet again our expectations are limited. Mr. Danellis, one minute. Mr. Danellis, please. Thank you very much, um, President. The international community was very relieved at the news of the destruction of the um, chemical arsenal. But now um, people are worried again because it seems that these chemical weapons are going to be disposed of at sea. And um, it's not even clear that there is a, a proper register of the, the, the chemical weapons which exist. Now, what are the um, implications for security and defence our policy. We cannot simply remain idly uh, spectating from the sidelines because this is something which is of importance to all of us. Um, action in the Mediterranean we, is important for all of us. We must um, have full transparency in order to uh, banish this, this spectre and this, uh, this nightmare. And let's not, let's not forget that 2014 has been designated Year of the Mediterranean. Thank you. Mr. Kiraza Babetia. Señor Presidente, Comisario, estimados colegas. President, Commissioner, it's quite clear that in Syria the European Union is facing a, a huge external political challenge. The situation is very complex and difficult to resolve, but it's also very clear that a democratic resolution of the Syrian crisis needs to take account of the religious, ethnic and cultural and historical diversity of the country. As Mr. Fula said, the Kurdish minority is 10 percent of the population, and if we don't take them in count, we will, in account, into account, we will not be able to uh, reach a diplomatic solution. We need to count on the Kurdish population. The west of the country is uh, uh, dominated by Kurdish interests and it is uh, regrettable that the uh, the majority is not actually uh, represented in the Geneva con uh, Conference. The PYD were also uh, locked out of the uh, conference and uh, they're really necessary. Their particip participation is necessary if we want to have a successful diplomatic solution and that's why I call upon the Commission to encourage the 
Western Kurdistan Council's participation in the resolution of the conflict. Next, Mr. Sophocles. Thank you, uh, President. I think the statistics speak for themselves. From March uh, 2011, 136,000 dead, 2 million 400,000 refugees, and 2 million have left the schools, and many schools have been uh, demolished and destroyed. This, uh, despite the, ac the actions of the United Nations. We have to be effective, but we have to. We, it will take um, a clear position on the part of our security and defence policy, or the war will continue. The dead will continue to um, to die. People will continue to die, and we will adopt resolution after resolution. But we'll not bring anyone back to life. We must help the Syrian people to help them decide who will be ruling them. Um, efficiently and that's a lot to do. Thank you very much indeed. Ms. Kronberg. Thank you, Chair. In Syria, the internationally approved principle of responsibility to protect is a joke. The war goes on, air, air, is, air aid access is not uh, available and people die. The implementation of the responsibility to protect in, in Syria cannot depend on a leader leaving its power, and it strongly challenges the state's right to kill its people. I think there is a need for a new mandate in the United Nations to actually implement this principle. Thank you. Mr. Ziobro. Padło tutaj na tej sali wiele ostrych słów pod adresem reżimu syryjskiego. Bashar al-Assad and the Syrian regime have rightly been criticized by people in this house. That kind of uh, violence and aggression has to be condemned. But the situation isn't black and white. There are two sides to the coin. There are various radical organizations related to uh, hardline Islam on the rebel side. They're attacking Christian villages, abducting clerics. Uh, and so it would be inappropriate for the West just to support the rebels without wondering who they actually are. Now, the fact is, a large percentage of the rebels are Islamists and attacking the Free Syrian Army, then we need to be quite clear about whose side we're on. Um, and finally, Mrs. Costa, you have the floor. Mrs. Costa. Mrs. Costa. You shouldn't be on your telephone when you're about to be called to speak in a debate on Syria. Hello. You have the floor, yes. Thank you, President. Sorry, you took me by surprise. Um, just the other day in Rome was a meeting the high-level group on the humanitarian challenge, uh, challenge in Syria and nine countries under UN auspices, uh, where Commissioner Georgieva said that despite the fact that um, three million had been uh, given. The Syrian belligerents are not uh, allowing the, money, the um, help through. Seven million people have now been cut off from supplies, and in Lebanon, more than a million refugees, which is a quarter of the entire population. The Union must send out an appeal to the Geneva Conference and to the talks, which will resume in uh, February, and to the Security Council to evaluate the um, work of the Syria group since it's necessary to keep an eye on the political developments. We must have a humanitarian corridor, which we've been asking for for s such a long time, and that corridor must be kept separate from the political dimension. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to get a response 
and help to uh, a population uh, which has um, which has been so hard hit. Uh, now we come to the response by Mr. Fuller, speaking on behalf of the uh, Vice President of the Commission and High Representative, Lady Ashton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, uh, Honourable Members, uh, let me start uh, by appreciating uh, the role of the European Parliament uh, in the search for the solution of this unprecedented uh, uh, crisis. We are taking uh, all the comments, remarks, ideas uh, which are being raised at the plenary meeting like this very seriously. And I think that uh, particularly when we are addressing uh, this unprecedented crisis uh, the situation of Syria is imposing on all of us, it is even more uh, 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 the truth. So let me start by addressing uh, some of your questions and suggestions while we continue to reflect uh, on, some, uh, on some others. On humanitarian conference, uh, let me uh, make it absolutely clear that we have that very much on our mind. By the same time, we have to take into account the present efforts of the United Nations that has been recently launched under OCHA auspices with the European Union support and uh, the member state support. A high-level humanitarian group has been meeting several times, most recently indeed Monday in Rome, I've referred to it, and Commission Kristalina Georgieva attended this meeting. Uh, so we need to avoid the duplication and work in a coordinated way. Uh, my colleague Kristalina does not miss an opportunity to use the Foreign Affairs Council to raise this issue. We are working together on the idea of the trust fund uh, which would be devoted uh, uh, to uh, Syria uh, and run by the European Union and maybe that could be a good opportunity then to come back uh, to the idea of EU humanitarian conference. Now concerning the issue of the consular office uh, in our bill, let me just uh, refer that it is member states' responsibility. Concerning the question of Mr. Uh, Belder, uh, we will indeed uh, provide him with the written uh, uh, answers. Uh, I would like only to say that uh, as we are going to have on Monday a political dialogue uh, together with Kathy Ashton on our side uh, uh, and uh, Ahmed Davutoglu, the Turkish Foreign Minister and his uh, uh, new colleague European Minister um, of, of, of Turkey will definitely be talking also uh, about uh, Syria and uh, the cooperation between the EU and uh, Turkey. And concerning the question on chemical weapons, uh, there has been, uh, I hope, uh, quite a uh, full and comprehensive reply uh, to a number of the parliamentary question which is uh, uh, available to you. So let me uh, conclude by underlining our most important ongoing efforts to assist Syrians in need. First, while the first round of negotiations did not produce results, the European Union is committed to assist in all ways possible the parties and organizers in sustaining the effort started on 21st January in Montreux. Second, I would like to re-emphasize that the European Union will continue in its humanitarian efforts and press all parties to allow unhindered delivery of humanitarian aid and countrywide medical care in Syria, ensure respect of international humanitarian law and allow the citizens to evacuate. We will continue to spare no efforts to deliver life savings and medical aid to besieged areas. And we will also assist in advocacy efforts to insist on the safe and full access of health teams participating in the polio immunization campaigns throughout Syria. We will maintain all other forms of assistance, including those targeting areas under the control of the opposition, to maintain and develop the most vital services, 
with these and many other efforts the european union will help syrians to reach their goal of living in dignity freedom and democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. That debate is closed. The vote is at midday tomorrow. And we now turn to the related issue of Syrian refugees arriving at the Bulgarian borders. And uh, the first speaker of the Council is Mr. Venizelos. Mr. Venizelos, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Honourable members, the migratory flows in Bulgaria and indeed other countries on the external borders of the EU, particularly in South East Europe, are connected to the worsening of the situation in Syria. Because of their geographical situation in Bulgaria, there is a large number of, of people requiring international protection. And there are member states which are exposed particularly to the uh, effects of the Syrian crisis. The Council has taken cognizance of the recent uh, January report by the UNHCR on refugees. This report talks about the difficulties being encountered by people who require international protection. And clearly this is connected to uh, Bulgaria with regard to the accommodation um, conditions and the non-governmental organizations have also been uh, involved. I wish to stress that the member states have got a duty to ensure that the accommodation, the reception uh, conditions are up to, up to international level uh, for those requiring international protection. The um, member states who are receiving the, the, the brunt of these movements require assistance. The Bulgarian authorities in particular have said at the highest political level that they are prepared to respond properly and adequately. And yet the facilities are limited and meeting needs from those coming from Syria is uh, turning into a major challenge. Uh, the report from the um, UN agency, which I mentioned, um, praises the efforts which have been made to make sure that the reception facilities uh, are there in the sufficient quality and number, and also setting out um, details of how they will have to be organized. The report re acknowledges that this has already led to an improvement in the situation. The Commission, as the, uh, and they will no doubt uh, confirm this, will be visiting uh, Bulgaria next week uh, to uh, make inspections and will, uh, I'm, I'm sure, come back with uh, uh, more recent information and updates. The Parliament takes a close interest here. I know that members of the Parliament have visited recently uh, Bulgaria in order to uh, see the challenges faced by that country. Special attention must also be paid to the uh, points of entry uh, for into the EU by the